The As Is podcast does not necessarily hold the views or opinions of our guests. The guests have a right to express their own thoughts, and those thoughts are protected with their freedom of speech. What they say is what they say, and we allow them the right to speak on their own behalf. The As Is podcast is not responsible nor liable for the opinions and stories of others. Welcome to another edition of the As Is podcast. Today's special guest is none other than Miss Thelma Wright. Tell me there. Yes, I'm here. How you doing today? I'm doing fine. How about you? Oh man, it's been one of them days. <laughs> <laughs> it's been one of them days already. <laughs> but I think it's you, all good. <laughs> I think you're gonna make it better. Hey, uh, uh, I hope so. I don't know. You, you know what? I want to get into your story, but before I get into your story, I want to talk to you because uh, you're a rarity. Uh, and the reason why I say for the listeners and for the people who may not know. Uh, you were the star of one of the shows on American Gangsters. Uh, what season was that? Uh, I am featured on the BET American Gangsters Trap Queen season one, episode three. Okay. I watched your show. Uh, I watched all of them because uh, this mm-hmm. is my lane. This is my genre. But one of the things that's fascinating to me about uh, a woman's story, uh, in particularly yours, was the psyche and I'm going to be uh, respectful but informal. So some of the language that I may use is not to be facetious or malicious. And it's not directed towards you. It's just in conversation because I think you're another level in a different uh, environment of conversation if there's such a thing as that. Because, meaning coming from the streets. So you know what mm-hmm. it is already. So mm-hmm. I, I never understood the nature of a nigga. And the reason why I say the nature, <laughs> the, the nature of a nigga is because... You know, I've been in the game. Uh, I was not on the level that you were on. I was not on the level that your husband was on, I, but I was in the game. And mm-hmm. it's different levels to it. But mm-hmm. it's rare to see a woman in charge. So I want to go through the process of what comes in a woman's mind, uh, knowing that she's messing with someone that's the caliber of the man you were married to, like that attraction, the, the magnetism. Before you get into the story, break down the psyche of a woman for me. Well, let me start with the fact that when I met Jackie, my husband, um, I was 21 years old. Okay. Um, I prior to my relationship with Jackie, I was with a guy who was in the number business. So he was a street guy, but a different type of street guy. You know what I'm saying? And um, and and that relationship was toxic and bad and and i ended up coming back home and then a few months later you know i met jackie now as i say in the documentary when for people that will watch it you'll hear me say like i heard of jackie before i actually met jackie right and you know his name was ringing and all i'm from south philly this was in south philly but at that time in philly itself there were you know people were guys were in the street making a lot of money so they were driving big pretty cars and you know hanging different places and all that even though jackie was never like a club guy he was never a guy to just hang out but you would see him out so when when i was introduced to him i was dating someone else and then when he found out i ran into him and he found out that you know i was no longer in that relationship we became friendly, like, hey, how you doing? You know, when I would see him and different things. And then one day he asked me to go out. Now, I'm just coming from a toxic relationship. I know at that time Jackie's in a relationship with someone else. I don't know her, but I know he's in a relationship. I don't I'm not looking to do that. I'm looking right now to take a break. I'm the type of woman that. I can't go from one relationship to the next relationship or pick up the second dude because I know this one relationship is getting ready to end. I know people do that, but I'm just not that person. Right. So I, I needed a break. <laughs> I wanted a break. And so I didn't think that was a wise thing for me to go out with him. You know, I knew who he was. I, I, and a little bit, I was a little bit intimidated by who he was. I knew he was older. I knew he was a guy getting money, but I just was like, hmm. No, you know, like uh, very politely, like uh, then I ran into him again, ran into him again. Finally, we went out. And that night when we were together, it just felt so natural. It felt like this is who I needed to be with because 
Jackie was a person, a man of his word. He was a what I call a man's man. He was he was the type of guy that if he said he was going to do something, he was going to do it. And if he couldn't, he was man enough to say, I'm not, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that or whatever. And he was very polite. You know what I mean? And, and he was the type of person that was easy to talk to. So it was easy and it came natural for me to fall in love with him. Right. And, you know, our relationship, you know, we had in the beginning, it, it was really good. I mean, you know, just spending time with him. And at that time, I find out he's like things are not that good financially for him at that time. His car broke. He used to have someone come pick me up. Um, we would walk places together because I lived, you know, right in South Philly. So we could walk into Center City. We could walk. But it, it was more so a thing of spending the time with him. And he gave me time. So he made me feel very special. And then I always felt protected with him. You know what I mean? I, I, I noticed the admiration that people had for him when we were out. Hey, Jack, how you doing? You know, the way he would talk to people, the way he presented himself. So that made me feel good. So in being with him, I felt good. I, I, I never felt like I was in any danger, at least not the first year, <laughs> right. at least not the first year. I never felt like you know, he would do anything to put me in harm's way. And when you saw that documentary and I talk about how we were in L.A., he took me to L.A. with him and we were sitting with his people around in a room and they're passing. At that time, they were doing freebasing and they passed that pipe around that room. He politely put his arms around me and he said, no, we good. She good. Right. That could have been different. You know right. what I'm saying? That yeah. could have been different. But I was I wasn't I never got high and he knew that. And I'm sure he respected that. You know what I mean? But you know that could have been different. Definitely. Without My whole doubt. life could have changed in right. that room. Right there with that one hit. I, I with that, exactly. Exactly. So that's that was the Jackie that I fell in love with. You know what I mean? Of course, it got rocky, you know, through the years. Um, You know, I talk about, um, you know, when he got shot and they gave him the painkillers. And then I got to see this other person. You know what I'm saying? But um, by this time, I'm in love with him. So, well, you know, it, to me, I'm a rider. Like, you know, whether you're my my friend, my female friends, they can tell you I'm loyal or you're my man. I'm going to be with you. You know right. what I mean? Now, you may be you may be losing a piece of me along the way, but I'm going to ride with you as long as I can. But OK, I get all of that. But what I'm trying to find out is the psyche of it for you as a woman. Like when these kind of men appear in women's lives. Because it happens a lot, maybe not on the level that you are on. And I think a lot of young women get uh, misled simply because they buy into what appears to be a fantasy life because of the drugs and the money. But with that mentality, is it like, because I've read that you you were a good girl growing up. You come from a Catholic household. Yes. You know what I mean? So you yes. was like, mm -hmm. would it be safe to say you were square? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let me ask you this, something that I noticed. You said that he was older. How much older was he than you? Uh, nine years and a few months. Okay, so did you take him with that psyche as an authoritative figure, a father-like figure? What prompted you to give in? No, I didn't look at him that way because I had a very good relationship with my father. You know okay. what I mean? I knew who my father was. I wasn't looking for daddy. Okay. It was more of a respect factor. Um, it was just the way he made me feel and the way he treated me. Right. So I felt... I felt empowered being with him. I felt good being with him. Okay. I feel as though when I look back on it, I feel as though it elevated me in a sense. It did. I think so. I think I, I feel that way. That's how I feel. I feel being, because even now Jackie's been dead 35 years. Right. And even now people will say, sometimes they don't remember my name. They remember my eyes. And they say, hey, Jackie. And then, then they go, oh, and I go, no, no, it's OK. They Because they say, well, I know where you belong, like that type of thing. You right. understand what I'm saying? So it, to this day, even one of my male friends who's like a brother to me, he said, you're you going to always be Jackie Wright's wife. And I go, no, what, what if I want, I want to get married again? What if I he said, oh, I'm just saying people are going to always refer to you as the Jackie Wright's wife because that respect factor is there. But what will you refer to you as if you got married? Again? Mrs. Whoever I am. Really? 
Yeah, because if I marry someone else, that's now my husband. Jackie will always be in my heart. That's never going to go away. I have a son who looks exactly like Jackie. Okay. So Jackie's going to always be in my heart. But if I marry someone, I love this person that I'm marrying. I am Mrs. Whoever I marry. Right. I'm his wife now. Right. I have to give respect to my husband. Right. You understand what I'm saying? But also the flip side of that coin is it's difficult. <laughs> and I'm telling you what I've been through. It's difficult to meet a man that is secure enough within himself to say, hey, yes, that was her life. That was her past. But this is who she's with now. Right. That's hard to find. So it is very hard to find. <laughs> is that are you married now or? No, I'm not married. now. Is that the reason why? No, I think that I was I did get married a second time, but it didn't last long. And that had nothing to do with Jackie and I. It had to do with. I think he was just an individual that wasn't ready to be married. He had never been married, didn't have any children. He'd understand. I'm a package deal. I had a son, a young son at that time. Um, it had nothing to do with that. But I do feel that I don't, I feel that I'm not approached by men because of the my Jackie Wright connection or my past life. What people need to understand is that that was my past. That was from 1986 to 1991 is when I had my run. This is 2021. Right. I'm not that same person. When I look back on my own documentaries, I do mentoring and, and things now, and I watch my documentaries sometimes over and over, and I sit myself and I sit and watch, what the hell was I thinking? Right. I wasn't thinking. You know what I mean? So I'm not that person that I was back then. I'm a whole different woman now. Right. I mean, so... You know what? I think I believe in, in relationships. I think that if you're in a relationship, it should elevate you. There should be something that you should walk away other than a nut in, in bad feelings. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like if you can't, mm -hmm. if there's no growth, then what's the point? And I don't what's think, the point? Right. I don't. But I think you find that lesson out when you get older, because when mm -hmm. you're young, you don't realize that you're just doing it for whatever the reason may be. That's why I was asking you the psyche of a woman when approached by a man on the level of your ex-husband or, your, you know, if, if I'm saying and also, I'll tell you this: when I never imagined when I when I started dating Jackie, I I thought it was going to be. He used to call me his sweetie, his little sweetie, like you know, because I was younger, and I I didn't think it was going to develop into what it developed into, <laughs> right. a son and marriage, and you know, so it was fun and it was nice and and I like I said, I felt good when I was with him. You know what I mean? And I and I look forward to the next time of being with him. I never imagined it would grow into what it turned into. And I, so I, I don't think that people usually realize that until it actually happens. Mm -hmm. That's how it goes. OK, now let's get into yeah. the story. Uh, reading about you, it says you, you got with him in 1977, but he was known for being a ruthless uh, with a ruthless Philly street gang that was known for murdering police officers. How true is Not that? True. Not true. Not true. Okay. Not true. Um, I can tell you that um, when I met Jackie in 1976, and then we you know, started dating 77, when I met Jackie and we started spending time together, he had told me about uh, a murder case that he had that he beat, but it was not with any police officers. It was not in any robbery. I don't know exactly what happened between him and this man, but it was a he was charged with murder. He beat the case, right? Okay. Um, he had no no kind of record of uh, of uh, interactions with police officers at all, other than them trying to get him for selling drugs. That was it. Okay. Prior to me, you know, years ago when they had the gangs, he was part of a gang. 22nd and South is the gang he belonged to. But no, he never had any type of interactions with police or murder or police or anything like that. Well, maybe they attribute that to him because they said he had an association with the uh, Black Mafia. Black Mafia. Exactly. Maybe so. OK. Were you familiar with the Black Mafia back then? I had only heard about 
the black mafia and read about the black mafia. When I, I remember a Sunday breakfast, my dad used to make our breakfast on Saturday and Sunday morning and we'd sit down as a family. And I remember we had, um, I don't remember if it was the Philadelphia Inquirer or the Philadelphia Bulletin, but they had like a magazine section right. uh, in the paper, Sunday paper. And there was a little magazine thing in there and they had a picture of, of, of various people and they were talking about the black mafia organization. So I had become a little familiar with the name and then my uncle used to write write numbers. And my uncle started talking and he would come over to the house. He started talking about how the city landscape was changing because um, the number bankers were being extorted by black mafia associates. This is what my uncle was talking about at a family a function one day. So I would hear these things, but I didn't know anyone because at this time I'm like in the ninth or 10th grade. Okay. Did you find that uh, intriguing and interesting? Well, I found it interesting that my uncle was talking about it, but not something that I carried beyond the house. Like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, they talking about that and whatever, because I was an athlete. So I was in the sports and I was dating sports guys. So that didn't affect me as far as I was concerned at all. Okay. Take me into the drug game with uh, Jackie. Tell me the first interaction that you had with drugs prior to him dying. The first interaction, I remember... um, I remember Jackie told my son the story. I remember Jackie sending me to McDonald's once. <laughs> McDonald's used to have the spoon, <laughs> the, the stirrer, you spoon. know, for the coffee. Yeah, the long black. Remember that? I remember. I remember him sending me for that. And I remember going to a store that that's in Philly and downtown Philly. I think it's called Wonderland where you go and get the glazing bags. Okay. The little glazy. So he would send me, you know, to pick up those things like that. And then I remember sitting at a table with him while he cut what, you know, it was a glass table and he used a card and he had the quinine and the bonita. Right. And they cut the dope like that. <laughs> I, 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 experienced, <laughs> I experienced that, but I couldn't tell you the formula. I couldn't tell you what, you know, what they put on that, how much of Bonita, how much, of, I don't know. I don't right. know that, but I was there. So I, I did see that. And then my first experience with the free base was when in 1978, he, when he took me out to LA with him and I saw the um, cocaine and the baking soda and the, and the pipe, you know, um, these were all new experiences for me to be around drugs. Right. Did it scare you? No, I was with Jackie. <laughs> I was a Jackie. I wasn't afraid of anything when I was did a Jackie. It tur- did it turn you on? Off? No. I knew that was his business. Not off. It didn't turn I didn't me say on. off. I said on. Did it turn you on? On? Yeah, on. No. No. It no, no. Well, no, it didn't turn me on. No, it didn't turn me on. I, I mean, I had a little bit of fear for him. I, I was always afraid for him until one day he sat me down and, because Jackie was a teacher in his own way. And I remember being afraid for him and him saying to me, don't Brown, he used to call me Brown from my maiden name. He said, Brown, don't be worried about me. They know what we do, but nobody's going, they need somebody to take the stand. They need somebody to to snitch. Ain't ain't nobody going to snitch. Right. So, you know, that kind of eased my mind. But I was always worried about him because he's in the street and he had areas and he was meeting with people. And, you know, so I was always, you know, fearful for him. Right. So when did you actually get incorporated into the drug game upon uh, the relationship? Like, tell me your first drug deal transaction, real transaction. No, no, I'm sorry. I don't want to go there because he passed before you had that. Or am I correct? Did you have one before That's he correct. passed? I did. I did. I did one be- that he didn't know about, and I told him about it. Okay, tell me about it. So, you know, he had sent me. To, he had sent my son and I to LA for our safety, and uh, a friend of a friend of his, well, actually, his mule. Um, sh- we had a mutual friend, and she told me that our friend was trying to get something, and she asked me if I could check. So, my play niece, her boyfriend was in the game, and they lived out there. And so I talked to him and he said, yeah, auntie, I'll take, I'll do that for you. So he said, just come to the house. So they lived in Baldwin Hills. So I went to Baldwin Hills and I was driving a, uh, 190 E190. Right. So I go out there to the house and he told me to pop my hood and I popped my hood. He gave me an ounce and he stuck the ounce inside of my car in the front with a 
engine was. Right. And I drove it on, <laughs> drove it on back to Gardena. You know what I mean? And uh, my friend, she brought it back. That was my first time ever. And I told Jackie about it. He came out to see us and because we were we had separated, but we were working to try to reconcile. And I told him what I did. He said, you did what? <laughs> he said, you did what? Hmm. And I said, yeah. And he said, what did you charge? And I told him and he said, what did you make? And I told him and he looked at me and he smiled and he said, OK, don't do that again. What was the feeling like? What was that first drug sale feeling like? It was empowering because it was my money and he couldn't <laughs> tell me what to do with my money. You understand? <laughs> right. It was mine. It, I had made my money, even though it was not something that I wanted to do. Like, oh, I think I want to do this again. Like, it wasn't like that, but it was, oh, I just made my own money. Right. And it was, and it, and it appeared to be simple. Right. So do you think that's one of the one of the disguises in the drug game that gets people hooked and caught and trapped? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I don't know what they're doing now. From what I hear now, there's no money being made. But, you know, we made a lot of money in that game. Right. It was a lot of money. It was a oh, lot of money. You know what? You know what? Not to cut you off. I think that there's still money being made, but there's a difference in value of money. What these guys today consider money the older generation, they don't consider that to be money. You know what I mean? Like, cause back in the day, I understand. you know, you might've made a hundred thousand a week or whatever the number was. And today a, a, a guy getting 5,000 a week thinks he's doing it. <clears throat> Excuse exactly. Me. It's just a, a, a different value system. And I think really social media has taken up even with the drug game. Cause dudes today, they don't even want money. They want a like or a view. Everybody wants to be popular now. You know what I mean? So you mm -hmm. could be popular with, uh, with broke pockets. Fortunately, back in them days, it wasn't like that. So your first deal you did on your own. Now, when did you get involved and how did you get incorporated with your husband? When did he pull you to the side and say you down with me on some drug shit? Or did he say that? No, no. You talking about after Jackie passed? No, before. I want to get. Oh, before. before. Well, well, no, I, I didn't do any drug, drug transactions when Jackie was alive. Other than that one I did right before he got killed. Okay. So, you know, I was just with him. And then once we once we got our home and I, I had my son, I was completely removed okay. from his business other than him coming home and talking to me about something. And he didn't tell me everything. OK, you know, tell but there those, were things. Tell me what those, me? I'm sorry. Tell me what those conversations were like, because you know what? I've said this before and I've, I've I, I'm not on your level at all. So I'm not even going to try to pretend that. But. There are similarities, and I think all men experience that because when you're in the game, you do go home and you have a confidant, and usually your confidant is your girl or your wife or your woman, however mm -hmm. you want to call it. So tell me some of those stories that you could think of in your head, and what were your responses? Because the reason why I ask is a lot of men from that lifestyle look at women for their intuition because a woman can tell mm -hmm. you some shit that a mm -hmm. nigga's not going to tell you, and you That's may right. not listen to her. And you fuck around and be your ass in jail. And Shorty done said to you, I told you. And that the first thing that happens when you get in court is, damn, she told me not to do that shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so take yeah. me to some of those conversations with him. Well, I remember one situation where my son was, was young. And um, he was young. He wasn't even walking yet. And my father would sign for Jackie's cars. Okay. And he at this particular time, he had a Corvette. Jackie was very he tried to be very security conscious and very cautious on how he did things. Right. And so, you know, like if we travel, we traveled like under Mr. We traveled under my parents name okay. like that or and, and my house at that time was in my name. Like he was very, very cautious. But the car was in my father's name and uh, someone had done something out in the street transaction with someone and they were, and the guy that did the transaction was someone who did business with Jack. So someone was trying to set this particular guy up and, and they knew about it. He must've discussed it or whatever. And so Jackie decided, okay, we got to fall back. But in the meantime, they must've ran a tag. The, t the car was registered to our house, but in my father's name. Well, I, I learned things like about pen registers. I, d I didn't know what a pen register was, so what I'll explain it? what that is. So Please. a pen register is when the feds run your 
uh, they run the tag or whatever, they get your phone number. And every time a call is made to that number or every time you make a call, they're notified. That's a pen register. Wow. And it runs, it runs for like, well, I don't know what's going on now. Let me, I'll just always repeat that, but it ran for like 30 days. So, but after it's, you don't know it's being done when it's being done, but then after it's done, you have to be notified. Wow. So there was a letter that came that there was a pen register uh, done on the house number. Now he never used that phone. Okay. I, that was my phone. And so, you know, talking to girlfriends and talking to my family or whatever, whatever. So, you know, he was cool with that, but he knew that this particular guy was trying to set them up. So he, you know, he told me, he told me what was going on. And he said, matter of fact, I think I'm going to get rid of this car and get something else. And uh, he did. He ended up getting rid of the um, Corvette and getting like a Honda or something like that. You know right. what I mean? To switch up. But he was very he was very cautious about different things. But he was goes back to the respect factor that, you know, people would kind of let him know what was going on. You know, if they knew, they would let him know. Right. Even to the point that there may have been somebody who was working with the with the police, the local. And they knew who that guy was. But the guy would give them information, too. Right. So those kind of conversations. And then before he sent us away, that it was the start of a, of a war. It was a, a war was brewing. And he, he called me one day in the middle of the day because I had, I had been talking to him about us possibly getting a bigger house. The baby had come and the house was a, it was a three bedroom, but it was a small three bedroom, even though it was a single, it was more like a townhouse. Okay. And I said, well, you know, is it possible we could get a, a bigger house? And he said, I don't know. I don't know if we do, we're going to have to cut back on this and, you know, no going out. No. I'm like, okay, cool. Cause I wanted a bigger house. And so he comes home, he calls me and he says, Hey, and I said, Hey, he said, uh, I'm on my way home. I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. And it's afternoon. It's afternoon in the spring. <laughs> that didn't happen. Okay. So I knew something was up. So when he came home, he started explaining to me um, different things that had happened. And he, and when we would talk, he would sit across from me. Right. You know? And so he was talking to me about what was going on. Well, I was a nervous wreck. And he's, you know, first thing I had to do was go to the bathroom. I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, I'm like, oh my God, like, what, okay. is, what is this? What does this mean? You know what I mean? And he said, listen, you know that I'm not going to let anybody do anything to me. And you know, I'm not going to let anybody take nothing from me. Right. I said, yeah, but what does this mean? Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking ahead. Right. I'm thinking like, what does this mean? And he said, listen, everything is going to be okay. It's going to be fine. He said, but that house you want? I said, yeah. He said, go, go find a house. Now, I didn't start thinking about this until later years, probably after I did the book and talking with my son. I was like, you know what? He decided that it was time to get that house because he knew this people. Some people knew where we lived. Right. So when we got the second house, people didn't know where we lived. Right. But he did not just he did not bring that to my attention. He just said because he knew I would be excited about, oh, I I can go find a house. Right. And I did, you know what I mean? So these were, and I think he depended on me for, you know, behind the fact that he knew I didn't get high, but he, my rational thinking, I think he depended on me for that. Right. I think, you know what, I don't know him and I'm just listening to your story, but I think that you're hundred percent correct because when you come from that lifestyle, you do have a woman as a confidant. And a lot of times you can make a choice and you can make a decision, but you need that person to validate it. And, and it mm-hmm. can only sometimes come from one person, like, you know, somebody that's not really close to you or even a family member. They can't say to you what she can. And it's just a respect level that that comes with the game. And I don't think exactly. that most men realize that. And the ones that do, I think, are older and the young ones today, they don't really get it. Like there has to be a confidant. So in those times, he, I guess he looked at you and he respected your intuition. Tell me what you would tell him. Uh, in regards to doing something, how would you go about by saying or chastising him verbally? Has there ever been a verbal chastisement from you? Mm, you wasn't going to chastise him. I had to be <laughs> careful. <laughs> yeah, that's how I got shot. Oh, uh, shit. You, okay, we'll yeah, get you had, that. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> you had to be, I had to be careful. After I learned, you know, I started learning him right. and, and learning his ways and different things, I would pick my time to discuss, but I was going to say what I wanted to say. That's a woman for you. You know what I mean? I was going to pick my time. Yeah, I was going to, 
I was going to pick my time, but I was going to get it in. You right. understand? Like, like, I mean, we would talk about, we negotiate, Jackie was, I don't know, we had funny ways. Uh, we would negotiate almost everything. Like for instance, example, my son, okay. uh, you know, Jackie had been married before. He had other children older than my son and I had never been married. I didn't have any children. And I, you know, one day we're talking and I'm like, you know, one day I would like to have a child. And he said, yeah, I know. He said, listen, I'm tired of taking care of your child. And I said, no, I know you are. I said, but I'm just saying one day, you know, I would like to have a child or whatever. He said, oh, okay, we'll talk about it. And then later on he said, okay, you know, we, let's see what we can do. Okay. <laughs> right. So we have my son, even with our marriage, like we had a conversation one day about, he wanted to have a two. He wanted to have a two day party. His birthday was coming up, and I was like, a two day party. I said, why do you want to have a two day party? He said, because I just do. When the way he said that, I said, okay, I'll leave that alone. So I left it alone. So we started talking about marriage, and I said, well, I know you've been married. You probably don't want to get married again. He said, no, I really don't. I said, but that's okay. I said, but eventually, we're going to have to go our separate ways because one day I want to be married. Right. And he said, I respect that. He said, I respect that you want. And I understand, you know, and I was like, OK, it wasn't an argument. It wasn't a debate. It was nothing. That, none of that. About two weeks after that, he comes home and he said, let's get married. Wow. So you think you put six the seed, weeks later? You think you put the seed, you think you put the seed in his head? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because I let him know that that's what I wanted. And 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 and, and I mean, the reality was that if you don't marry me, that's fine. But one day I want to get married. So that means we're going to have to go our separate ways eventually. Right. Would you have taken that threat and, and carried it out? Honestly. Would, would say that have, again? Would you have taken the threat of one day we're going our separate ways and actually left? Yes. I just don't know when. <laughs> and I can tell you it would have been difficult because I say this now to, to my mentees. And to my nieces, you know, I'm like, you know, once you have a child with someone, my mother told me this when I was pregnant, though, once you once you have a child, your life is no longer about you. You will make decisions that you never thought you'd make. Right. And my mother never lied. <laughs> and she never lied. She's and right. that's the truth. She's, She's right. absolutely right. And and so it it may have been difficult for me to do that because. There were times that I wanted to leave Jackie. I'm going to be very honest. Like, I couldn't take it between, the, you know, the, the cheating and the, and the street and the abuse. And it was just too much after a while. And, and, and I, now I have this child and I'm like, you know what? I don't want to raise my child in this environment. Yeah. But what am I? And this is, the, this is a battle that I'm having within myself. Yeah. What am I going to do? How am I going to possibly give this child the lifestyle that I know I can have with him? Right. And this is his father. I don't want my son to be raised by someone else. This is his father. I love this man. I want to be with this man. But this is becoming difficult because I don't want this lifestyle. And my husband definitely didn't want the lifestyle for my child, because even when I was pregnant, he kept saying it was a boy. I kept saying it was a girl. He kept saying, oh, he's going to be a boxer. He's going to do this. But one thing he's definitely going to do, he said he's not going to be in the street. I'm going to give him the best education that money could buy. He would always say that. Right. And so when the opportunity came, when he said, I got to send you guys away, I felt like and I told my parents, this is it. I'm never coming back because I felt like, OK, the door is opening. I can go. And if he wants us, he's going to change some things in his life. Right. Can I give you my and opinion? So, can I give you my pardon opinion? Pardon me? Can I give you my opinion? Sure. I think that he felt the exact same way that you felt. And and, and I'm just going to be, I'm going to keep it 100. We, we're on some street shit. Niggas know what they do to women. Niggas know what happens in those type of situations. And I don't think that we intentionally do those type of things. It just comes out. It's a part of the game that niggas don't really talk about. There is abuse. There is hand problems. There is sometimes you talk to women a crazy way. But deep down inside, that man loved the shit out you. Trust me on that. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. You know what, though? Shabazz, I'm not going to. Hey, you know what? He loved me. That man loved me. Yeah. He was who he was, but he loved me. Yeah. That, there's no doubt about that. And and that's how, no it is, doubt. This, that's how it is in the game. But you got to also understand that we come from a different era. So, like, mm -hmm. just even listening to what you said, your mama said, you don't, mamas ain't saying that shit no more because they 18 and they don't know a goddamn thing they damn self. 
You know what I'm saying? So they're not they not giving the lessons the way our mothers right. gave us the lessons. And right. I just think that whole mentality of ride or die, it, it, it's a different uh it's a different definition coming from ride or die from your mouth as opposed to ride or die from somebody that's 27 because your ride or die, you had an internal conflict as if you wanted to stay or leave and, and, and you laid on that today's mm-hmm. ride or die is impulsive and impetuous and they will run with a decision immediately. And a lot of times those decisions get you fucked up. Mm-hmm. So I respect the fact that you went about it that way. But I can just tell you from being in the game and listening to you talk about him, I know that you were definitely somebody that he loved. And although he may not have agreed with what you said at the time, I think women like you put seeds in men's heads and it resonates in a nigga's mind for a minute. And sometimes Mm -hmm. you just don't really want to you don't really want to say that, you know, that they're right. But the way you say that, you know, that they're right is you come back and you talk to him again. Because if you exactly. were full of shit, <laughs> it would have been no, I need to talk to you. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Right. So right. Even, I get it. Even though the man has the power, I still think that sometimes niggas look for their mama and their woman. But niggas don't want to mm-hmm. admit that. Because the only mm-hmm. people that's going to really keep it real with a nigga or a man is his mama. You right. You understand what I'm saying? That's so, right. So exactly. I, I think that both of you had relied on each other for that. Uh, that's just my opinion from listening to the story. Mm-hmm. And, it, mm-hmm. you know, that's just how I see it. But now, OK, mm-hmm. we're, we've gone through uh, your actual feelings in, in through the game and some of the things in the beginning. Now, I noticed that you said you were shot. Tell us the shot story. What the hell happened? Uh, the shot story. So it was my birthday. Uh, 1979. And. Uh, his one of his partners had died suddenly. I mean, like the people thought that he had been poisoned or something like that, but I guess getting high or whatever, his heart couldn't take it and he had a heart attack and he died. And so, you know, in the game, like, and I guess beyond sometimes people feel like when somebody dies, they don't have to pay a debt. So they were running around, you know, trying to collect money that was out there. Right. And so um, one of his friends picks me because he would he would either have somebody pick me up or he would pick me up from work. So this particular day, one of his friends picked me up from work and I'm like, well, where's Jackie? You know, he says, oh, you know, he's over Earl's house. And I'm like, all right, I'm going over there. He said, no, don't go over there. I said, no, I'm going over there. It's my birthday. I haven't even talked to him today. I'm going over there. I didn't know he was high. And so um, when we go over there, um, and this is in the summer, summer of August of, of, of 79. So it's still light out. And so uh, I go over and I'm like, hey, how you? He's good. You know, and he's got this big Mexican sombrero hat on. He's got his oversized shirt, you know, which many probably had Larry, which he did. He had Larry and Barry, his two guns, uh, 38s on, you know, on each hip. So I realized he's high. So. I said, oh, I didn't hear, you know, I didn't talk to you today. I didn't hear from me. He said, look, look, Brown, go on home. He said, we're trying to get this money. He said, I'll kept, catch up with you later. And I was like, all right, but now I got attitude. I'm spoiled. I'm, you know, my birthdays were always special from a kid, you know, Trust always, me, you yeah. know. I know that. <laughs> I already know. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, so I'm like, oh. So, yeah, okay. You know, so I go to walk away. But when I go to walk away, I like turn on him and, you know, kind of grit on him. Like, eh, like, nigga, like, you know. So when I go to walk away i see that he has the gun out but i'm not afraid you know jackie had guns around me all the time i wasn't afraid and so when i go to take my next step i'm hit in the leg and i fall he shot me but the crazy thing was that when i fall i fall down and everybody that was standing there was it was him it was two other other friends and and a and a woman when I fall, I, I hear all the commotion, like, and one of his friends, like, Jackie, Jackie, and he had him pinned up against the wall and had both guns out on him. He, like, kind of snapped. Right. And the guy said, his partner, and his guy said, Jackie, come on, man, I got her. I got her. Go ahead. I got her. So I see, now, as I'm on the ground, I see his brake lights come on, and I'm saying to myself, he's leaving me. Wow. He's leaving me. You know, and so they scooped me up, put me in a car. My leg was on fire, right? Yeah. And uh, the hospital was only a couple blocks over. They rushed me over to the hospital. When I get to the hospital, there's white detectives. There's not, for me, there was another shooting, and I guess they were already there. But 
when I get there, they put me in an emergency and they're ripping open my, my pants leg. And then my father appears. I don't even know how he got there so quick. My father and my sister are there. And they're asking me questions about who shot me. And I'm like, I don't know. My father's hollering screaming, yes, you do. Because what happened, mm -hmm. Jackie called my mother because he was close to my mother. Well, he's close to both of my parents. But he, he calls my mother and he tells my mother. My mother said he called and he said, "Miss Brown, she said, yeah. He said, I just shot your daughter. And she said, is she alive? And he said, yeah, she's alive. He said, I didn't mean to shoot her. He wow. said, I didn't mean to shoot her. I just, I just shot you straight. Wow. And she said, where is she at? Where, where is she? And she said, she's at graduate hospital. So she said when she hung up the phone, she told my father, she said, cause she didn't want to, she didn't want to come. Wow. And she told my father, go to graduate. That fool just shot your daughter. Wow. So my father, you know, when my father, said, yes, you do. Yes, you do. You know, and I'm like, no, I, I don't know. I said it was it was a bunch of confusion out there. I said, and I heard the noise. The next thing I know, you know, my leg gave out. I, I, I didn't know who shot me. Wow. But what do you, so that was a big thing. Huh? Do you feel that that was a, uh, you can you attribute that to a black woman trying to protect a black man even when he's wrong? Absolutely. You know what I contribute that to? I contribute that to crazy love. I, 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 that's exactly. what I call it in my book. Yeah. It's crazy love. Yeah. You yeah. watch the documentary. You hear me talk about, listen, if you, it's crazy love to love someone so much that they can do something to you and you don't want to do something back to hurt them. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to break you up real quick because I think you on my level mentally. Do you still love him? I will always love him. Stop. It ain't crazy. Because if it was, I know. you'd still be crazy now. <laughs> well, I, well, you know, I say, I say this to my son all the time. I say this all the time. I said, you know, he always says, Mom, you, you, you've been through a lot. I just came through breast cancer, Shabazz. Right. I just I'm glad came you through made breast cancer. I'm glad you made Thank it Thank you. That. Thank you. And, my, and I say that. I said, you know, I've been through so much. You know, I said, oh, I'm a little crazy. Because, I mean... You know, to been to go through all that I've gone through and and still survive, I know God has a plan for me. I, I feel like, you know, what I'm doing now with the mentoring and you know trying to trying to talk to other people about different things and making the right decisions and all these things. I feel like this is what I'm supposed to do. So it this is. is what I do. It is. This it, is what I do. It is. But I, this man, I learned so much from Jackie. I don't believe that God makes any mistakes. There was a, he brought him into my life for a reason. He gave me my son for a reason. All of these things happen for a reason. And, you know, I will always love it. He will always be a part of my life. Would I be in love with him? I don't know that. Would we be together? I don't know. But what I can tell you is if he were alive today, we would be the best of friends. You would always have. And this is my opinion. I could be wrong. But I would think that you guys will always be off and on. If you're not on, you're going to always be. If you're not off, you're going to always be on. That would be a back and forth know. love forever because it, it's too deep. And let me just tell you my uh, analysis of what you just said. My opinion is the first teacher of a black man is a black woman. But the black woman must be pr taught properly herself to teach others. And I think that he taught you a lesson and validated uh, what was all, the strength that's already in, already in you to allow you to teach others. And I think that's something that a lot of relationships, they just don't have. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, that's how mm -hmm. I see it. But you know what I want to get into? Uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't talk about that does come with the game is sometimes a person does get drug addicted and they get high on their own supply. Take me to the mentality that you had when he started uh, abusing drugs. And what drugs was he abusing? Well, he abused, at the end, he abused cocaine. Okay. Um, you know, he would go off and on um, with that. Originally, when we got together, he wasn't getting high. He was strictly about his, his money and hustling and all that. Right. But I think that when his associates got killed and people were trying to kill him and all, I think I never used Coke. I don't know, but I think he needed to do what he needed to do to take him to another level. Yeah. That's what I think. I don't know because I never did it, but I just feel that way. But yeah, he was, um, you know, after he got shot himself in 78, he, um, cause he told me he used to take pills years ago. He was a pill taker. Right. And when um, when he got when he got shot, you know, he uh, he 
I thought we were going to lose him, but, you know, he came through. But he was taking pills. He started getting high again and all that. And then he stopped. Like, Jackie was the type of guy. He could do I, – I, I talk to my son all the time. Like I said, in the wintertime, he would eat meat and different things. And I say – he said, you know, meat makes you mean. Why do you think that people, the trainers and boxers and all – because he would work with fighters and stuff. Why do you think they, you know, use meat and do this and do that? It makes him mean. He, but in the spring and summer, he thought it was cute. He'd have all his tailor-made clothes on. Mm -hmm. And he was eating fruits and vegetables and being a vegetarian for those nice summer and spring days, you right. know. So he had control of what he wanted to do and what he didn't want to do. Right. But how did you feel when the drugs? Came? I mean, did did you did you see a metamorphosis? Like, did he just yes. switch from? De yes. Describe that. Totally different person. Um, you know, the mood swings, uh, the 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 the. The nasty attitude, the I don't care attitude, just, you know, no more humble Jackie. Like Jackie could be very humble and very polite. And, you know, when he started getting high, it was, oh, my God, I just wanted to get away from him. I just wanted to, you know, <laughs> be someplace else. Right. And so that's why when things happen and he sent us away, I was happy to go away. He said, don't ask me any questions. I said, I have none to ask. Right. I'm ready to go. Right. Because I couldn't continue to live that way, and I didn't want my son around that. But he was never home anyway. Right. He was always gone. I respect that. But you know what? In hindsight, in your hindsight, for my opinion, and let me just me say that again because I wasn't there. But in hindsight, in my opinion, you saved him. I mean, he unfortunately passed later on anyway. But I think that you saved him uh, from an earlier demise. And I think women don't realize the power that they have, especially in those type of relationships, because re regardless to what you think, there's a dependency and there's a dependency on a man feeling dependent on his woman, even with him sending mm -hmm. you away, because that's, you know, like that's a, a, a piece of your lifeline, so to speak. And then in addition, mm -hmm. you, you know, every story needs a witness. So part of, I think, your story being you're the witness to that to be able to tell others. And I think at the time we don't realize that we're writing our own autobiographies in our life. But we do realize that I need to put this and instill this in some, somebody. And I think that somebody was you. And I think that you're a living reflection of that. And I don't know if you even understand how deep that is, the responsibility that you carry to continue to to do exactly what you're doing because a lot of people sometimes can't accept it mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. like have you ever thought about that i have and what was your conclusion my conclusion is i gotta do what i gotta do right i i have a calling and 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 i'm very passionate about what i do right and you know, for people to know my story, they have to know the story. And right. that involves Jackie. That involves me talking about like we're doing right now, you know, where, what I've been through, how I came from there to where I am now. Right. And so that's very important to me. And so that's why I know it's going to take a very special person to come along and understand that. Like right. that's her life. That's what she does. But I know how to separate the two. Right. Let me be the bar I humbug. I do know how to separate them. Let me be the bar. Pardon me? Let me be the bar humbug for you, right quick. You're not What's gonna. That? You're not gonna find a nigga like that. They're rare. Like you may end up just being alone by yourself, and I'm not saying it to be facetious or malicious to towards you or wishing you bad luck, but those type of men that really under. First of all, they're old school. They're definitely not right, gonna be in right. school. <laughs> you are gonna have no, to find some. You know what I'm saying? And that's they're, right. They're rare. You know They're what I mean? Real. I think Allah mm -hmm. blessed you by giving you one. And sometimes mm -hmm. the one is all you get. But because right. he knows that you're strong enough to carry it that way, that one may be, that's it for you. All I get. And you know what? And and you know what? And that's okay, too, because I've thought about that, what you just said, that it may be that that's it. It may be that, you know, I'm not going to settle. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to And you ain't that. supposed to. Hell no. I'm not there. Yeah, I'm not going to do it. I'm right. not going to do it. So if that means that I am alone, I am. I, you know what I learned how to do? I learned how to do things by myself 
since Jackie died that I didn't know before. I didn't know how to go to a movie by myself. I didn't know how to go to dinner by myself. I even went on a cruise by myself because I wanted to see and teach myself that it's okay to be alone. You'll be all right. Right. And so this is what I've done. And so if it, if it means that, then it's God's will that that, that, I don't have a choice because I'm not going to settle. Right. And you know what? I'm not. I tell you something else I'm not going to do. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to explain. Okay, I meet someone and they hear about my story or they know. Then they want me to sit down and talk to them and tell them why I did. No, no, I'm not. I'm not doing it. But the reason why you I don't think you should do that anyway. And this is why your story and your situation is delicate because you really can't, as people say, go to the squares because they're never going to get it. You have to be in, right. the, in in that limelight or that lifestyle or that line or train of thought in order to even understand. And when you find someone who comes from that, there's no need to explain what's understood. If you right. go outside of that, you're going to be explaining for the rest of your life. And I think you're a special person. I think women like you, uh, they're special people because, you know, I, I think for a man, you search for women who have your mentality and the understanding. And that's why you end up with so many baby mamas and so many different relationships because they're rare too. A lot of right. people talk that talk, but when they get down to it, they, they can't stand up to that shit. And that's just how the game goes. So let me take, take me to, uh, take me to the incident that led up to his death. Well, um, it's crazy. I had come back, my son and I had come to visit and he st- was telling me about this guy, Dennis. I had only met Dennis one time at a party and I didn't even look at him because somebody said he called himself a pimp or something. So that didn't, mm, you know, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't focus in on that, you know? <laughs> and so anyway, he told me that, um, he had fronted Dennis a Kia Coke for 25,000. He couldn't find it. And I tried to convince him, but now I understand why he didn't, but I tried to convince him to let it go. Right. I said, well, you know, you got to let that go. And he said, no, I can't let, because he was a principal person. And I understand it now that I've been in the game. He said, I can't let that go. He said, no, no, he got to pay me. Jackie would have never done anything to Dennis because he had enough sense to know if I do something to Dennis, I won't get my money. I just right. want my money. You right. know what I mean? If he got a piece of it to me, I just want my money. Right. And so what happened is um, Dennis, he was calling and calling Dennis about the money. And Dennis's girlfriend set it up, which I'm still to this day really pissed off about this because she set up the murder. She knew that it was going to happen. Dennis told her when Jackie got there, he was going to kill him. You know what I mean? And uh, she set it up. And um, when Jackie went, she told Jackie to come because Jackie had been calling. And she told Jackie to come uh, at a certain time to her house where I guess they would meet. And uh, when Jackie got there... Um, she let him in or somebody let him in and Dennis was standing behind the door and shot him in the back of the head and killed him. Wow. So uh, she, they went on a run and I think within a year she turned herself in because she claimed that Dennis tried to kill her. So she turned herself in. Dennis kept running and eventually it caught him. I think in like 92, he went to trial like 94, got convicted, got a life sentence and he died in, they said 2010, right before I did the book. Um, he died. What about her? So, but she didn't do a day. That's what I'm pissed about. She didn't do a day. Was she still um, around? I guess. I guess. I don't even know what the chick looks like. I saw her at the preliminary hearing, but I don't remember her. You know what I mean? Right. And and I couldn't go to the trial because our attorney called me and said, I don't think you should go anywhere near that trial because they're trying to implicate you in that. Right. I didn't even know these people, but yeah, that's what happened. But I tried to convince Jackie to pretty much do what I ended up doing which was he could live in L.A. um, and he could live in L.A. and then travel, you know, back and forth or whatever he needed to do, but get out of the city. I kept trying to convince him of that and he didn't do it. Okay, so now he's passed uh, and Mm -hmm. you're getting ready to get in the game. Take us through that. What what happens? How does that happen? So during the process of 
leaving homicide and trying to plan the funeral, one of his associates that he had been doing business with for quite a while, older gentleman, um, he comes to me surprisingly to pay the debt that was owed. And um, he says to me, you know, we're going to have to keep going. And I'm like, what do you mean? He said, well, (laughs) I'm going to need work, you know. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't know. Let me see what I can do. Let me see what I, because I hadn't thought about that. Right. And um, I said, okay, well, let me check to see. And by this time, Jackie's dealing with auntie, who was an older woman. And she happened to be in Philly. Um, you know, she came into town once she found, well, she was here actually when he was missing because when I was looking for him, she was looking for him because he had met her at the airport, put her in a hotel, but then he never came back. That's when he got killed. So I reached out to her to let her know that I had this money for, her, but I also let her know that they wanted to try to keep going. And she said, well, yeah, we could do it. She said, and I'll, I'll show you how we can do it. And so by the next month, September, I just stepped in it. Not even not even thinking about it, just stepped in it. But I was living in L.A., so it was easy for me to maneuver. And we had, you know, we had our girl that would carry, you know, what we needed, take it where it needed to go. And that was fine. And then I just started expanding and it got too big, you know, became too big. So we started doing it through the mail. Before we get to that part, explain to me or, or if you can remember what was your first lesson when you, now you're on your own, you, you got a direct connect. Uh, what was the first lesson you learned? Was it to cut? Was it to rap? Was it, what was it? Nope. Didn't have to do any of it. Didn't have to cut. Didn't have to rap. All I had to do was let auntie know what I needed and where I needed it to go. She took care of everything. And then I made arrangements on how I would get my money because it was pretty much cash and carry and it was weight. What? I didn't, I didn't, yeah, I didn't want to deal with territories and have to be coming back and forth to Philly and all that kind of stuff. I didn't want to do that right. because I felt like that would make me too susceptible to a problem. Right. So I didn't want to do that. How much money are we talking? Uh, I can't say, you know, there's no statute of limitations to the IRS. Oh, okay. <laughs> there was a lot of money. <laughs> there's a lot of money though. We made a lot of money. Okay. Know? All right. So now. Let me just ask you this. In hindsight, because you were successful doing that, and I guess the success <laughs> you know, came. Started out. I think. Huh? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Not as good. I think you got me on head jack. Wait a minute. Can you? Can you hear me better now? I hear you. I hear you. The, okay. The question. I just got in the car. Okay, that's fine. The question that I'm going to ask is when you. Uh, got into the game, I think you got into the game as a result of his death. But have you ever thought to yourself, if only Jackie had done it this way, he might still be here? Yep. I think about it all the time because that's what I I tried to talk to him about that. I tried to talk to him about possibly, I had no idea about the mail, but I knew that there would be a way that he could live in L.A. and be with us because now we're trying to reconcile. So I felt like he could be in L.A. and be with us and still conduct his business. Right. And he said to me, well, what about my people? And I'm saying, we're your people. What people? Right. Do you think his loyalty to his people was part of his downfall? It was absolutely the downfall because he he wanted to look out. He looked out for that guy, Dennis. And I found out later that Dennis was a smoker. Right. He probably knew Dennis was a smoker and getting high, but he also felt like, I guess, that Dennis was going to pay him. Right. But so, I don't think it was ever Dennis's intentions to pay him. Right. I mean, right. Okay, so now you're in the game and you're doing it the way that you know how to do it, but you got you learned that as a way of default because of his death. So you kind of learned, exactly. learned that lesson the hard way. So now you're getting money, right. you're doing what you're doing. Tell me, when does your downfall come, if it ever comes? Yes. Well, what happens, you know, we always think that things are not going to happen to us. Right. You know, we yeah. always feel like, oh, no, that's not going to happen to me. Or, <laughs> exactly. you know, I'm going to do it different. And and I did feel as though I was handling things differently. So I had, like, I mean, a five-year run of really only one guy who didn't pay me and I just cut him off. It, 
It was about me being safe, and it was about us making money. Right. And so in, in the last year, in the summer of the last year, 91, by this time I'm now producing comedy shows and things like that. And one, one night after one of my comedy shows, my partner, Naeem, and I and a couple of his friends, we headed up to an, another section of Philly that was really rough, West Philly, where it was a club called Studio West. But we had to go there to pick up some tickets for an event that was coming up on the weekend. And we get up there, and little did we know there had been an argument with somebody who he was cool with and some other guys. And it turned into a shootout, and Naeem gets killed. Wow. And somebody holds a shotgun to my head. and But I think they recognized me from doing the comedy, probably felt as though I wasn't a threat to them in any way, and they allowed me to live. Right. And two weeks after that, one of my associates does what you're never supposed to do. He calls on one of the packages that he's supposed to get. He knows he's never supposed to call on a package because it's an illegitimate package. It's yeah, drugs. Exactly. If it's missing, just let me know. We'll fix it, right? Right. Well, he calls on it, and days later, the DEA delivers it, and he gets a case. Now I'm looking at the possibility of a conspiracy case. And then the following month, in August, Auntie takes a ride with someone, and they go to a house on the east side of L.A., and wherever they go into this house, everyone in the house gets killed execution style. Wow. Wow. So that was the end of it for me. It was like they're like, you know, you don't even second guess. Well, what do I do next? What do I do next? I go sit down. Right. That, yeah. So that ended everything for me. So, so was there any jail time, any, uh, any investigations, anything? Was it just? Oh, absolutely. There was, the guy ended up getting, uh, the guy ended up getting eight years and there was an investigation through United States Postal Service with the postal inspectors, which they did come to see Auntie. She called me, she told me, we would talk like every two weeks we had made a deal, let's just talk every two weeks and see how this goes. And she told me not to worry, she would handle everything. So they did come to see her the first time. But I guess after that, when she was killed, I guess that ended that. But we found out on this end in Philly that there was definitely an investigation going on within the postal inspectors. They were trying to track all the packages that had been going out of L.A. to particular addresses, I guess, from a particular address. See, me, myself, I never sent any. Right. So, but they were coming from the West Coast. Right. So, so that ended that after she was killed. So now she's gone. Jackie's gone. Uh, I assume that you had some money uh, after all this. I had some assets. Yeah, assets. Then I went to work. (laughs) Okay, that's what I was going to ask. What was next? What did you do? What did you do? I I went to work. Well, see, I used to work. So I went back to where I come from. Okay. Um, I um, started as a receptionist. Uh, for a nonprofit, uh, not a nonprofit, but for the union for the city of Philadelphia, I took a job as a receptionist and I stayed and learned the skill to become a legal secretary. So I started working as a legal secretary. Okay. And, um, you know, just really went to work and kind of just laid low and, you know, made a promise to God and to myself that I would never get involved in anything like that again. And would not even date anyone involved in that business like that. Wow. You know, it's funny when you say uh, the date part. You know, most things happen. When guys go to jail and you're in the game, either one or two things happen. Like, niggas don't be shit in the first place, and they don't really take care of you. It always is a female that holds you down. Uh, Coming from the level that you're on, once all of the tragedies started to happen, mainly Jackie being gone, how many of his friends, if any, came at you for them to now have their turn with you? If that was for uh, them to now have what their turn with you, meaning I don't mean it in a, in a nasty way, but they're shot at you. Is that a better way? To none, say it? not not none. You didn't have but, to. Nope. He, but Jackie had told me the funny thing is in one of our conversations, he had said to me, if anything ever happens to me, don't you ask any of them for anything. You go to work. You'll be OK. 
Right. So, but no, I never, I never encountered that. So you mean none of them, none of them never came at you? Nope. Wow. Why do you think nope. that was? You think that was out of respect for Jackie or you just had the no nonsense approach and look? <laughs> I think it was the no nonsense approach. <laughs> 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 I think it was, you know, you know, no, people don't like rejection and stuff. So. <laughs> right. I think, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe it wasn't their type. I mean. People think I'm kind of, um, I don't know. I'm not difficult to get along with. It's just that. You're black. You know, I changed. <laughs> pardon me? You're black. You have a black woman mentality, and that's a strong woman. Yeah. A lot of niggas, <laughs> they, they can't deal with that. A lot of niggas can't yeah. deal with that. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I think you would. It, it was destined for you to have a man like Jackie because women like you or this mentality or this conversation uh, goes with a man of power. Like, I don't think somebody right. beneath you or somebody beneath his level, it, it, it won't really work. Because in a way, right. you might be mad if I say this, but you need to be controlled as well as you control him. It's like a dual control with each other. And I don't think that women that have strong personalities and mentalities are easily controlled. Right. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean. I mean, you know, but see, I did a lot of growing and maturing while I was with Jackie. And and as I say in the documentary, like, I learned what I wanted, what I didn't want, what I would, you know, I mean, I just became a woman. I grew up. But don't you think that's intimidating to the average man? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> there's, there's your answer like that's a no brainer yes I do <laughs> you know what I mean so that's why I'm saying right. you gotta get this certain type of nigga that even understands that and they just not out here that's just how I right. see it like you know what I mean that's true I agree with you like, I agree with they're you. just not out here so like on some real shit like you could be my sister cause I'd have taught you the game the same way he taught you the game you know what I mean cause I really? think yeah you, you got a lesson it was a learned behavior. I don't know if you even realized that he really educated you. Would you agree with that? Say that again. Do you do you realize that he really educated you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I credit him with that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, yes. And he taught of, me a lot. Yeah. A, a lot of women, they don't agree with that. And, and sometimes they're bitter. And you said he had a, other kids when you when he was around right. during those times. Did you ever have baby mama drama? Nope. Nope. No. Let me tell you, he was very he was very strict about like um, no one. Uh, the kids, We, you know, I could see some of the kids or when they were little before my son was born, I would have. Uh, his two older children, like, you know, take them to a play or do something with them. But he was very particular with the baby mamas. Like, if you wanted to get in touch with him or you, you had to go through his mother, you couldn't, you know, they didn't have access to where we live. They didn't come to our house. They didn't call our house. None of that. Wow. None wow. of that. And if we were out, you know, I knew Jackie was was doing his thing. I, I didn't really know with who until toward the end, one, one girl in particular. But... If we were out or when we were out, you know, he had a thing about me. Like, you know, he protected me. Like, he didn't allow, you know, I see now a lot of confusion and drama and mess that goes on where, you know, women will approach another man and all, you know, different stuff. No, he wasn't having none of that. Mm -mm. Right. Mm -mm. You better catch him by yourself. Right. That was a Because he wasn't, yeah, he wasn't going to stand for any of that kind of stuff like that. Right. Okay, so no. now we, we, we've gotten past all of that. Tell me where we're at today and what do you do? Well, yeah, because I got to wind down. Um, so what I do now, I do mentoring. I have an empowerment program where I mentor um, juveniles, um, at-risk females. Um, I had been going, before COVID, I had been going into prisons, um, not just with youth, but I would go into um, I went, matter of fact, I went into Youngstown, Ohio to one of the higher security prisons. It wasn't death row, but they were on lockdown 23 and one. Wow. And so I was working with the ministry with that and I would go around and talk to um, the inmates and stuff. But now I do mentoring with youth. I go to like after school programs right. and I work with the juveniles who are mandated from the courts to programs. 
Right. And um, is that fulfilling for you? Yeah, right now it's it's in Philly, but I go every no, no, I'll go not, wherever. Not Pardon in me? Philly. Fulfilling. Does it fulfill you? Does it fulfill your soul? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I am so passionate about that work. Right. You know? I even my my last contract that I just ended about two weeks ago, I was working with little girls the age of seven and eight years old. Right. Yeah, seven and eight years old. I right. mean, um, and it was it, it just amazed me their mentality and the stuff that they were aware of and the questions that they were asking and stuff like that, you know. But right. it's very fulfilling. I really enjoy that. Um, it's just it gets me because here in the city of Philly, they say they have one hundred and fifty five million dollars that is allocated to this gun violence. Right. Right. I'm considered a credible messenger to right. speak. Right. <laughs> they want to pay me pennies. Right. That kind of that kind of pisses me off. You know what I mean? Right. Um, because I know the funds are there and this is what I do. You right. know, this is this is what I do. So I actually have a call tomorrow to try to see if I can do three programs at one time under the same umbrella, because that way they can tap into their individual budgets and pay me possibly close to what I'm worth. Right. I don't think I, I, I don't think that there's a value that you can equate to what you're worth. Experience in life and what you've gone through, there's no value. There's no amount of money that can pay you that. I just don't believe yeah. that. You know what I mean? I understand yeah. that you need your yeah. money. Get your money. I, I'm not right. telling you not right. to get your money. But I don't <laughs> right. think somebody can right. pay you, you know, for what you've gone through and just the, the buildup of your character is, is invaluable. There's no price to that. And some people don't understand yeah. that. But listen, yeah. Uh, Hey, uh, if I can assist you in any kind of way, you need my help. Uh, feel free to always call me. I think you have an incredible story. Uh, Thank you. I think that uh, I think you're what's needed in the streets, and I, 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 you know, I'm pro black women definitely, and and I wish there were just more women who had that mentality outside of the game. You can only find your kind when you're in the game, and that's sad. You know what I mean, like. You can't find you in church or you can't find you in my experience. You have to come from a certain vein to get that certain type of a person. And I think that's right. you. And, and, and I respect it. But if you could summarize in the last question, this is the last one. If you could summarize yourself and all you've gone through, what would you say and how would you do it? <sighs> what would I say? I would say I'm a survivor. Right. I'm a survivor. I'm, I, you know, I'm a, I was once a wife. I am a mother, but I'm a survivor. And, you know, and I, I just know that as a, as a mother, you know, um, who had to, you know, raise a child from the age of three, um, you know, alone, like you, you just got to do what you got to do. And you got to understand that it's, everything is just not about you, but I would sum myself up to be a survivor. Right. You know what? Salute and respect to you, Black Queen. Salute to being a survivor. Uh, I thank you for the time for being on my show. And once again, I want you to know that if you need me, if there's something that I can do to assist you, uh, please do not hesitate to call. I won't. And thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank and you. also, before we go, yeah. my book, they can get my book yeah, on yeah. Amazon. T- shout yes, it out. My- my book is title is With Eyes from Both Sides, Living My Life In and Out of the Game. You can get it on Amazon. Sometimes it goes out the very next day. It's $15. And on Kindle, it's 19, I'm, I'm sorry, nine ninety five. Or they can just put in my name, Thelma Wright. It'll pop up, you know, and order the book. Yeah, y'all go get that book. She's definitely got the game. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate Thank you. you. I respect you. All right. All right. You Thank have a great you. night. All right. All right. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.